Um, why is Abraham Lincoln important? Why should we remember him? What's notable about him? Well, it's important to remember that the United States was founded on uh, certain fundamental principles, and I mean specifically the great second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. What's the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence say? It says, all men are created equal, and we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights that no government can take away among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, as you know, that's really the founding document of the United States. But as you also know, the United States wasn't living up to those ideas, was it? Uh, thanks to the institution of slavery and, and other foibles as well, but particularly the institution of slavery. Slavery had fastened onto the United States like a cancer. And it was not receding, as I think the founders thought it would. It was growing and getting worse. And why? Because it was immensely profitable. Up until my students in the Civil War class, because I teach a class on the Civil War that everyone should take before they assume room temperature, uh, I often tell them that uh, slavery was so profitable that the uh, thousands of people literally died to try to preserve it. A classic example of how profitable it was would be uh, if you look at John Calhoun, uh, or rather uh, Jefferson Davis would be a better example, who was the president of the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis owned a plantation in Mississippi along the uh, river the Great River, the Mississippi River, called Davis Bend, that he never visited. It was run by an overseer. Every year, the overseer turned or, or met with him and gave him a check for anywhere between thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars in eighteen fifties money. That's a lot of money. This is before the income tax. Ergo, you know that would be today what the equivalent would be seven figures today, would be millions of dollars. That was just his. After he paid off the overseer these associated expenses. And he never even went there. He was an absentee landowner. The point is, it was immensely profitable and it was immensely evil. Lincoln recognized this from his, the very inception of his political consciousness. Remember, Lincoln only had one year of formal schooling, but he says in his letters, from his very earliest political thoughts, he recognized that slavery was morally wrong. And it animated him throughout his life. Lincoln recognizes that early on it's an immoral institution. Once he gets into politics, what's the first thing he does? And uh, almost immediately, in the Illinois State Legislature, he actually passes uh, a resolution, or gets a resolution passed, this is in 1837, condemning slavery as morally wrong. Almost immediately. Then in the 1850s and the 1860s, he makes this great contribution, why we should really remember and that is this. Remember that the Northern Democrats wanted to compromise over the issue of slavery's expansion with Southern Democrats. They were going to allow it to grow. That was the whole import of the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. And Lincoln's great service to the Republic was that he resisted that urge. He urged a compromise on an issue which Lincoln perfectly characterized as an issue upon which there can be no compromise. You know, labor, human bondage for uh, work person benefits from your labor and you receive nothing. There can be no compromise over that. So when Douglas, Stephen A. Douglas, and other Northern Democrats were urging compromise over the issue of slavery's expansion, Lincoln said, look, we can't compromise on this. Because slavery is morally wrong and because it's antithetical to the ideal, the great ideal upon which the Republic was founded, which is the equality of man. And liberty is a fundamental right that can never be taken away by government. So slavery was antithetical to the Declaration. Lincoln's great contribution is to, act, is to take his moral argument and put it within the political realm as a definitional statement of what the United States is. We know that slavery is morally wrong, but even more importantly, this republic was founded on the basis, on the very ideal of liberty and human equality for all peoples, regardless of race, ethnicity. Lincoln calls that the great founding ideal that we always have to strive you know, he kind of metaphorically puts it up on the wall. We've, this is what we're striving for. We're not there yet. We're not even close. But thank God, it's the founding principle of the country. And it's always in front of us, and we should always be working metaphorically towards it. Slavery is the great contradiction of my lifetime. If we can eliminate that, we're one step closer to the ideal of what the nation should be. And so it's in 1854, again in 1856, in 1858, he's constantly making the case that 
Not only is slavery morally wrong, but as a nation, it's antithetical to the funding, fundamental founding principle of the country. We can't be what we're supposed to be as a republic if we allow slavery to persist. And he famously says in the 1858 debates with Stephen A. Douglas, Douglas is getting up and saying, look, I don't care uh, what goes on in the South about the institution of slavery. It doesn't matter to me. In the same fashion that the Cranberry Laws in Maine don't matter to me. Just leave it to the states. If they want to have slavery, that's fine. That's what this republic is founded on, states' rights. And Lincoln says, look, the republic wasn't, this is Cranberry Laws in Maine. You know, this is a fundamental principle upon which the whole country was founded that's being violated every damn day in the South. And millions of people, by 1860, there's four million slaves. Four million slaves are suffering deprivation of basic human rights so that Jefferson Davis can get a check for thirty to $35,000 a year from his overseer and you know, spend it on a townhouse in Washington, D.C. It's wrong. So he anchors, he takes that moral debate or that moral issue and anchors it in the American political debate and says, we've got to live up to this. We have to first contain slavery and place it on a course of ultimate extinction and then eventually get rid of it. But we certainly can't let it grow. If you let it grow, it'll persist forever. That's his great contribution. You know, without Lincoln, the political system might have simply compromised on the issue of slavery that simply would have gone on, would have persisted. I think, you know, students ask me this all the time. What happens if Lincoln doesn't make slavery a moral issue? Well, I think it persists in the 20th century. Why would you give it up? I mean, I took some students to uh, Charleston, South Carolina in 2013, and we visited a plantation outside of uh, Charleston, Middleton Plantation, which was used as a backdrop for the scene, uh, for move, uh, scenes of the movie Patriot with Mel Gibson. There's a marble statuary in their garden, in the garden of Milton Plantation, that was imported from Italy. It's the same kind of statuary that the Roman emperors used. The same materials hewn from the same. It'll be standing there when you and I are dust. That's how wealthy people were. I mean, they were living like gods. That's something I don't think that they would have willingly given up. Someone had to make the argument that slavery was morally wrong, and not only, not just in, in the fashion that the abolitionists were doing, not only in church basements, but in the political arena. That's what Lincoln did. And that's why I think Lincoln should be revered. Of course, he was a great war president. He did a superb job getting the country through the Civil War. Um, I mean, he made plenty of mistakes, and I talk about those at some length in my class. But he always kept the fact, the central tenet of the conflict and the central reason why it was occurring before the public, and that was the institution of slavery was untenable in the republic. And it was untenable to the American ideal that all men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that can never be taken away among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I revere Lincoln, I acknowledge his faults, and I go into those again at some length in the, in the class that I teach. Because he, he was not a god, he was a man. He was an imperfect man uh, who had uh, the prejudices of his era. You know, he was not perfect. And if you look at some of his uh, speeches and letters, you can see that. But the, good, the, the interesting thing about Lincoln is, and the thing, reason why he should be revered, is that he overcame those prejudices at a time when many whites were almost naturally racist, you know, because that was simply the what people believed at that time, and there was, there was nothing in the newspapers that they read that contradicted that. Lincoln overcame those prejudices. Lincoln recognized how antithetical slavery was to the fundamental founding principle of the United States. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And if you have questions, I'm happy to, I'm happy to take them. Go ahead. Um, personally, how do you think that he developed that kind of moral character it's a great question, and uh, uh, the question from the audience was, how did Lincoln develop that uh, character or, uh, that upon which these uh, attitudes are based? Lincoln's father uh, believed in corporal punishment, but was not someone who was an intellectual in any way. He was, he was a uh, scratch farmer. He was a subsistence farmer. Lincoln was intellectually gifted. 
uh, I had I was blessed to be on the uh, Lincoln's Papers Lincoln Papers Project, actually the Legal Papers Project, for years a fellow. So I was trying to find my way into the academic world and get a teaching appointment. And one thing that comes out of Lincoln's Papers is they bristle with his intellect. He was always the smartest person in the room. And I say that without you know. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a Lincoln idolater or worshiper. You know, I, I approach him the way that I do everyone else, and I can be very critical of him. But he was a very smart guy. He recognizes this early on. He has a real thirst for learning, and he's hunting books all of his youth. He's always trying to find books. It's one of the reasons why he knew the Bible backwards and forward, because that was typically the only book he'd get his hands on. But he would read all the time. Well, his father regarded that as laziness. You know, why aren't you out cutting down a tree? Why aren't you hewing a fence? Those pigs need to be fed. This cow needs milk. You know, he was a farmer, a subsistence farmer, sitting on your butt, you know, leaning against a tree, reading a book, struck him as laziness. It was not. You know, it was, in fact, he was an immense effort. My point is that Lincoln had this kind of uh, adversarial relationship with his father. This is, this is to go to your question about his character. His father would also rent him out to other farmers. He stayed with his father until he was 21, in part because his father wouldn't let him leave. Theore you know, theoretically, under the laws of the time, unless your parent gave their consent or you just ran away, you had to stay until you were 21. Lincoln's father insisted that he stay with him until he was 21, in part because he made some money off of him. He would send Lincoln out and say, okay, you're gonna go work for Farmer Brown. You'll be cutting fence for him all day. He would turn his earnings over to his father, who then pocketed them. He was a, you know, was a very, he was a very tidy little laborer for his father. A lot of historians think that this is what animated or made Lincoln anti-slavery. Because what was he? He was in effect, you know, in a kind of state of quasi-slavery with his father. As soon as Lincoln turned 21, which by the way he did here in Lincoln County, he was out of there. <laughs> you know, I mean, he has his birthday in February of 18, what is it, 1831. He's gone, right? He leaves as soon as he turns 21. So, but his father did teach him the value of hard work. And you know, if, you, if you're someone who is uh, intellectually gifted and you're inclined to do labor with your mind, having a taste of manual labor incentivizes you to learn and to, and to get out of that. So his father did do him a favor in the sense that uh, by making him cut, I mean, it's been estimated when they moved to Macon County here in 1830, it's been estimated that Lincoln cut like a thousand fence rails in the course of 18 months. I mean, that's all he did. He first he did it for his father, and then his father led him out to everybody else. So I think, and I, I tend to agree, I think that Lincoln's anti-slavery sentiments were based in part on personal experience. You know, also his own wide reading and his recognition of that it was morally wrong just by, uh, as a matter of principle. But his own experience of actually kind of this quasi-slavery thing to him. The other thing I would say, one more thing with, to answer this question is that Lincoln was always someone of a peculiar uh, or an unusual uh, sensibility in this, uh, for the time. For example, Lincoln was not a hunter. Lincoln shot one turkey in his life, was so horrified by it, he never hunted again. Well, this was at a time where every, every man of a tote and fish was out shooting everything that moved because that was, just, you know, you, that went right in the pot for dinner. Lincoln was horrified by that. He was always very sensitive to animals, and uh, there are all kinds of anecdotes. Some of them are probably bogus, but some are probably not of him helping uh, you know, uh, pigs that fell into a hole or something like that, or a horse that got bogged down the river. You know, the whole point is he's very, well, if you have that kind of sensibility, that too would kind of, I think, incline you to regard slavery as morally abhorrent. There's a great anecdote in uh, uh, the Lincoln letters. He, his best friend in life was a man named Joshua Speed, who he roomed with in Springfield when he first arrived in Springfield in 1832, 1833, I mean, a year long. And so they write back and forth because Speed eventually moves back to Louisville where the family plantation is and kind of assumes ownership of it. He has slaves. And so Lincoln goes to visit him and he takes a steamboat down the Ohio River to, to Louisville rather than go all the way over it. And on the steamboat are some slaves chained together. And Lincoln writes to Speed after he gets back. He said, you know, I, I, uh, I have to tell you, this whole slavery thing, I just turns my stomach. I'm paraphrasing now. Uh, looking at human beings chained together, Lincoln used to characterize it, chained together like they're on a trot line. You know, a fish on a trot line. Chained together like they're on a trot line. 
he said, I just couldn't, uh, the suffering was more than I could bear. And he went and walked and saw them and then had to look away because it was just too horrible for him. Well, you put that youth together, that youthful deprivation, and then his wide reading on whatever books were available, you get the sensibility, I think, against slavery. I hope that answers that question. Probably more than you, you needed to know, but that's what you get from the history professor. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a great point. Um, in fact, uh, one of the reasons why the, uh, there was so such a pronounced lack of sympathy for the abolition movement in the North was that very reason. Because lots of people in the North had very profitable relationships with people in the South. It's something, again, I talk about it some length in class. You know, Elijah Lovejoy, for example, who was the first martyr of the abolition movement killed in Alton, Illinois, in 1837, was killed in part because uh, People in Alton were concerned that he was publishing this anti-slavery newspaper in Alton that was going to ruin their business relationships with people just down the river. Uh, so they killed him. And New York City, another would be another example. There were lots of people called, in New York City who were called factors, who were the middlemen for cotton uh, sellers. You know, if you were if you owned a cotton plantation in Mississippi, you would have a factor or a middleman or kind of a uh, what would you call it today? Someone would handle the sale of your cotton. Year. And typically they were in some financial center like New York City. So there were lots of factors who made thousands, millions of dollars selling, you know, taking a little bit of the profit as they sold millions of bales of cotton overseas. So New York City throughout the war was a hotbed of pro-Confederate sentiment because, you know, they, they were more than happy to continue to make money on the backs of the slaves in the South. So it's a very good point. I mean, I, <laughs> I vociferously condemn the South in my course and also in everything I do related to this period. But that isn't to say that the North wasn't complicit, absolutely so. Uh, I mean, one of the problems today is that there's a kind of creeping neo-confederatism uh, that's out there and, uh, and there's a tendency to try to come up with uh, a, a kind of softer version <laughs> of the Confederacy of the South right now. So I spend a lot of my time trashing that simply because that's out there. But your point is well taken. I mean, absolutely, the North was very complicit in slavery. Cincinnati, for example, was a hotbed of pro-Southern sentiment because it was so close to Kentucky. It was right across the river, and they had wonderful relationships with, with people there. So, I mean, it's always important to remember that and, uh, Professor Matthews, and Matthews makes a great point. Um, and the proof of that, too, is that a lot of the abolition speakers and the you know, people who went out, like Frederick Douglass and others, when they spoke in the North, they were often stoned. You know, people would literally run them out of town throwing rocks and uh, tomatoes at them. So it was hardly, and being anti-slavery was hardly popular in the North. It's one, of, it's one of the reasons why I give Lincoln credit when he has this great debate in 1858 with Douglas. Douglas gets up and says, people of Illinois, of course he's looking at an audience of white farmers. I just want you to know that I'm in favor of, and this is Douglas, not me. I just want you to know that I'm in favor of a government by whites, for whites, with whites. And no blacks at all. You know, this is Douglas's spiel for, for three months, right up to the election. And it works. Lincoln gets up and says, and every, you know, any other politician would have just done me too, recognizing what, that that was the sentiment of the audience. Lincoln gets up and says, now oh, wait a minute. When I read the Declaration of Independence, I don't see anything in there that says, except black people. I bet he didn't get a single vote for doing that. In fact, I bet it hardened. But he says it anyway. He says it anyway. Lincoln says, he uses kind of a biblical metaphor. A man should eat the bread that he earns. And to take it away from him is fundamentally wrong. That's what he says in response to Douglas. Says, now this is just plain to white racism. He does it over and over again. It's actually nauseating to read. Read the debate sometime. It'll make him turn your stomach. It's awful. Lincoln gets up and contradicts him and uses the Declaration to do it because he's trying to bring the Declaration. He's trying to re 
animate the declaration in the minds of Americans. You know, how can we permit this? If this is our founding document, how can we allow this? We can't. I think it's deeply moving. I mean, it was an act of supreme political courage. And by the way, he lost that election. He lost. I mean, he wasn't willing to, like some people are today, he wasn't willing to say what was popular to win votes. He was willing to, you know, he said what was morally wrong. Or, or he uh, told people that what Douglas was uh, selling was morally wrong. I just bought a big picture of him I'm going to put up on my office. I've got Hemingway pictures in my office, but I'm going to put a Lincoln picture up too. So I'm a big fan of his. It was a pleasure uh, being on the Lincoln Papers project. I didn't. I don't want to spend my career in documentary editing because uh, sitting in an office for eight hours looking at documents is, I have to be up here to, you know, doing, doing this, but, uh, so I wasn't going to stay. But it was great to be there for a year just to read Lincoln stuff. It was very interesting. Other questions? How am I doing? Why don't you come study with us at Lincoln? You can do History of uh, Lincoln Studies all the way through. Or as a minor, you can do your science, or you do to do some science projects. Or you do science and do history as a minor. So we'd love to have you. And we have passionate, animated faculty just like Ann and I. And caring faculty, too, that spend lots of time with their, with their students. That's why we're here, because we love to work with students. Well, it's been great. I'm glad you're okay. Uh, my name is Dan Monroe. I'm the chair of the History and Political Science Department. If you ever have questions about Lincoln or if you just want to talk about Lincoln, you can see all my contact information is on the website. I don't mind people emailing me with uh, comments or questions about Lincoln or any history topics, so don't hesitate to contact me and reach out. I do that all day. In fact, every day is, uh, when, I, when I check my email, sometimes I hide out from it. <laughs> when, I check, when I'm not hiding out from it, uh, I all, every day people will be sending me, you know, I saw you give a talk uh, 18 months ago, I just, I just had this question, and I'm like, yeah, I'm happy, I love that. It's like, wow, somebody was, somebody was dialed in. It's great, so please, please don't hesitate to, to speak with me. Thanks so much. It's great, yes.